We really want to start around uh, the market itself. And obviously we're in a times that are just, there's not a, uh, a ton of, of uh, things to benchmark these times. And I guess the first question, and Patrick, are you, are you on? We don't see you right now, but uh, if you're on. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Uh, in a market that appears to have found a bottom, how can producers make sense of market signals in such confusing times? And maybe talk a little bit about the technical condition of the market. We, we really get focused on fundamentals as, as producers, but uh, maybe, maybe uh, talk about that from a little more of a technical aspect. Sure, okay. So the thinking process that I always go through whenever I examine kind of any market is that, you know, in order for you to keep a market at a certain price, especially a lower price, you need to find an opportunity and a reason to sell. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to have the market at this level. The lack of selling is usually a strong indication that there's a lack of profit, which we're seeing right now in the feeding community. If we look at who has the profit to lock in, that'd be the packers. Now, forward looking, I know personally with my own clients, we don't necessarily have a lot of cattle, even that are profitable, really forward sold. And speaking with larger uh, feedlot individuals, they don't have a lot of cattle necessarily forward contract with the packer either. Now, if we look at the, um, the commitments of traders report is basically just like a, a blanket view to see who the players and interactors are within the, uh, the futures market itself. Right now, the commercials are actually net long, which makes sense because they're hedging their profit margin for the box beef price versus the live cattle. So when we're seeing this forward looking profit margin, what direction does it point? It points bullish just with that simple notion. And then if I look further, where's the incentive in the, you know, the actual feeder, you know, us as cattle producers, where's my incentive to forward sell that price? The basis has already priced itself in. We're at like probably positive 20 cent basis, give or take at any given time. And if I'm forward looking in this regard, I've already missed my opportunity. So in that recognition, I'm realizing that, hey, there's probably gonna be a lack of sellers Sure, there's going to be some sellers, but as a broader base, am I be re being rewarded to sell in this market right now? I argue no. And so with that notion, me seeing these technical indications, giving me this forward view, it gives me confidence that we will continue to see the bottom be significantly formed. We'll probably see a, a drop in volatility that will then lead people to lean on more option purchases, which if you buy a put option, it doesn't necessarily push the futures price down. So it's those types of things that I really tie together with this stuff to, you know, while we're all worried about the story and, and think of the story as something that has to be sold too. If we're all talking about the same thing, I have to sell somebody new to sell that contract to push it lower. Well, once I run out of people to sell that direction to, it's probably time to go the other way. Because again, without sellers, I can't keep a market down there. And it's the same way that the top forms as well. In my opinion, we're far closer to the bottom than we are anywhere near a top. And there's a lot of mathematical form, you know, formulation that I've built and developed to kind of show these things. But I really think it's that simple. You bottom when you run out of sellers, you top when you run out of buyers. Right now, I think we're closer to running out of the sellers. Excellent. Uh, Gary, Scott, or Jake, do you guys want to weigh in on that uh, question at all? Yeah, sure. Yeah, Scott here. Go ahead. Um, go ahead, Gary. No, you go ahead, Scott. That's fine. Okay. Um, yeah, three things that I uh, try to look at when you got a market that's turning. Um, three things that can kind of work hand-to-hand -hand would be the basis, the spreads, and then the market. And they don't necessarily have to go in that order, but we had the basis one. Today we can start to check off some of these spreads, bull spreads working, and, and the market itself indeed going higher. So uh, those are three good signals that we saw today. Um, as we alluded to, some of the, the open interest has been part of the problem too. Um, when we get that open interest in the cattle contract below 300,000, we start to see quite a bit more volatility and in intraday moves from the limit ups to limit downs from day to day. We see a lot of that. And so kind of back to the question, you know, trying to capitalize on a market, I also agree, yes, definitely closer to the bottom than we are at the top. Um, I think we had our big push of anybody that really needed to get some hedges on, really needed some protection, some of the panic selling that has happened um, and that is done with. And now 
maybe there's some people that are trapped on the bottom as we move higher, but you know, capitalizing on the top side, there's some some deep deferred type options that I would look at. Um, look into some calls, uh, the DS 110s, were, you know, stuff like that. Um, October 106s, different things that you can kind of look at. Say you were hedged, you caught quite a bit on the way down. Now you'd like to, you've got this big dollar amount in your account, and you'd like to keep some of that. So, trying to look at some of those trades, how you can capture some upside without totally just being uncovered at all. We know that there's still risk out there, but um, as we see the kills start to grow a little bit too, I think that's starting to breed a little bit more confidence into the whole market. They're not coming very fast, but um, starting to see them grow day to day. Last week, I think that's the, the low kill week that we're going to have. So definitely trying to look at some different things that we can do um, to try to try to make some more room for that upside. I definitely want to do that. Gary, you have a comment there? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, one of the things uh, nobody or a lot of people don't like the options until they find there's nothing else uh, that uh, can at least give them a comfort level of, uh, of floor. And even though you're always going to have to give something up to have that floor in the cost of the option, even if you were uh, boxing it with selling a put or selling a call around it, it uh, – it definitely is, if you only knew the market direction, I'd use futures every time, but at least having peace of mind and keeping your margin uh, money requirements down uh, by using options is another key factor to be able to manage your um, monies to be used, uh, capital, and not have uh, a large amount of money out in the hedges at the when the market isn't going your direction but uh, that's just one thing i would was uh to add to it you bet jake anything to add on top okay we'll kind of keep going then uh, Gary, this we'll we'll start with you on this one, and I think we'll just keep going uh, throughout the the list of guys. It seems to work pretty well. Gary, with unprecedented volatility making options uh, harder to use the past few weeks, what alternative approaches or tools can producers use uh, with less margin risk? Well, I mean, uh, we talked about this a little bit, uh, you know, where. You've got uh, forward contracts, which are requiring uh, no margin requirement, but look at how much you've had to give up in the situation. And this is unprecedented times, uh, very hard to, you know, I've never seen it before. I think people that are over 100 years old have never seen this before. You know, So it's a situation that hopefully we don't see again anytime soon. But uh, today's cash market is $20 above what the June market is. So that guy that uh, had Kyle contracted, and I, we're in May, not uh, quite into June, uh, but even if it uh, looked back at 10 to 11 months out of the year lately, we'll have a, a much better cash than we will the futures. And so the benefit has definitely been going to the guy that uh, uses the futures or uses an option and that uh, volatility that we've seen I'd like to think this is the worst of it is behind us is but the uh, last two days we had limit down yesterday limit up today it uh, definitely action like that does not make it any easier uh, to buy a call buy a put or I mean buy a put sell a call sell a put underneath uh, but to harness the uh, break even or better profit that is one of the ways to do it uh, using a forward contract but uh, turn around and and uh, maybe do a portion of them instead of the full 100 uh, percent using those expensive options and sometimes I an option can look pretty expensive until you make a move like we just did of $43 unprecedented on June's cattle. Uh, 
you know, then that option looks pretty cheap. So there are some strategies of uh, selling options. I like taking advantage of that side, but uh, when you get the hype and the uh, deltas out of whack as far as uh, the uh, volatility, then uh, it definitely puts a new sense to uh, all the options, whether you've got them bought or sold. So you want to be careful, especially not going more than one for one, and uh, some of, and getting as wide of a window as possible, knowing your break even, feeling very very confident of that break even, to be able to uh, box that profitability. You bet. You guys, uh, Scott, any any further comments on that? Um, yeah, I think uh, as we look at it, we 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 know this is something we've never seen before. Agree completely with that, but have definitely had to use some creativity. I think uh, you know, when I first started. If you wanted to spend a couple dollars on a put, that was that was quite a bit to spend. And then as the years go on, three dollars, uh, you start to move up a little bit, and now it can be yeah, I'm willing just to straight spend three fifty on a put. Um, and, and it feels like a lot, but when you have a market that's that's this volatile and moving this much, uh, we can expect that that some of those strategies can can just cost a little bit more. Um, maybe be willing to spend a little bit more. And and in this question, there's not a not a one size fits all for everybody by any means. Uh, different thickness of skin, discount, different risks that you're willing to take. So. Um, Sometimes, uh, you know, when you have the puts that are expensive, so are the calls. You, you can look at putting on some windows, you know, you're buying a put that's expensive. You can find one to maybe sell to pay for some of it. And I agree with Gary on the, the doing a portion of it, you know, shelling out that much money, you know, and, and you're really trying to make a decision. Um, I'm never a guy that wants to just throw all your bullets at one thing and let, let's do this on all of them. I really agree with the doing a portion of them here. Let, let, let's try to build a little bit of a position here and kind of see how this works and kind of slowly start to get into some more, um, some more coverage as we kind of need it. So, so you're not making that one rash decision. Yesterday we're limit down. You sell quite a few of them today. We're limit up and suddenly, dang it, that was the, the wrong thing to do. So agree with doing the, the portion of it. And it's very rare that I like to do much of a put spread. I'm not much of a, a fan of that. I, I don't like to do something that gives me $10 protection to the downside, but then after that, I'm, I'm kicked back out again. I really try to leave that, um, that bottom side open if it's indeed something that I want for coverage. And um, I think just uh, last week I did my first ones of those. I hadn't done those in a long time. So it's, it's very rare that I like to do that. But that's also me saying that I think we're near the low. And, and we've also said, too, I mean, if, it's some, if this is something that you do, you're a put guy, you buy puts every single year, then I think you need to count yourself. Then you're a put guy. You buy puts every year because you have an event like this that breaks the market $40, $50. Your put this year just paid for your puts for the next 20 years. So it, it's sticking with your plan, what you always do. I know you might have had some break-evens in the mid-120s. Um, I have some of those myself, but I still needed to have some sort of put under there. And, and that definitely bails us out from the large catastrophe that happened. Patrick, I want to turn to you. We did get a, a question on the uh, the chat along these lines. and. Um, and looking at some of these more sophisticated option trades, um, the question is really about the risk of the position. And I how agree. should how, how should producers, especially in a time where equity, uh, you know, can, and cash is is really pinched? What what advice do you give to feeders to really examine the risk of some of these trades? And and there are probably no perfect answers, but talk a little bit about that and. The relationship with with lenders i mean admittedly like th this happened with you know, i was fortunate but this happened with my clients um well the market was going down um you know you're sending them back money right and a little bounce hey you're on margin call again well he just bought cattle he doesn't have money so then you got to reach out to the lender in the same way as like that's annoying it's also probably the best thing, right? He was averaging into a weakening market in the same way that, you know, he wouldn't have been able to either way. Um, to answer that, 
I think the put options are probably the most basic thing just to participate in. When the price of them is so high down here, there's kind of two ways that I look at it too. Um, and you'll notice like the option volatility has not dropped for the last like two months basically. And I do have clients that are just in strangles at this point, instead of necessarily getting long, you know, my version of being unhedged, being neutral more than anything. Um, but we've, in order for somebody to get squeezed, you need the options to be lower than where they're at now. And with the expensiveness of the put options, I have a very hard time seeing the person selling that side or the person really willing to go long with that type of uh, structure is going to have a hard time holding on to if the market pushes lower again. It's my opinion that the, the insurance being sold while the house is on fire is likely to be more expensive than the risk of you actually owning the cattle unhedged. That's at least what's being shown currently. I don't know if that's going to be perfectly correct. We all saw what happened with the April contract of cattle, but um, usually this drop in open interest within the futures contract and an increase in open interest with options is usually indicative of what I said before. You need sellers to keep the market down and you need them to be in the futures market itself to actually keep that futures price lower. Because the options, you got to realize, again, they're their own market. They're based upon the futures price. And if you don't have a, an active pressure to sell the futures, the options are meaningless. It's just all volatility at that point. Um, to, to answer his question of how do you interact with a lender, I think you just be really frank with them. You know, if, if he's going to give you enough rope to let you hang yourself, well, he should at least give you a, a knife to cut it too. And that's with an increase in lending availability to really do the right things, not just, hey, I got to buy a put now because darn, I'm getting screwed. You need to have a good relationship with somebody who's actually going to go to battle with you. And the, I, I can't remember who said this, but basically, uh, you know, everybody's in a, in a castle full of glass in these situations. We always think that, you know, somebody else is making all this money that everybody's losing. That's not the case. In a recession, everybody loses money. And it's the greatest stress test that everybody can have. And it makes you re-examine all the relationships that you have with everybody. You bet. Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely uh, a difficult time. And I think that, that uh, understanding of, um, you know, what it takes not only to run the business, but that there is some, there is a cost in risk management as well. And so having that, that strategy as part of your business plan probably makes a ton of sense. Jake, I'm going to turn to you um, in uh, switching gears, maybe just a little bit. Uh, we really have seen historic basis, you know, during this time period where uh, there's been a, a, a disconnect, uh, if you will, between uh, cash and, and futures and to varying degrees. How do you help your clients uh, forecast and really work through uh, these basis times? And not, I mean, it's, it's, it's great if we're hedged and, and, and uh, we capture a huge basis, but talk about kind of forecasting that forward and maybe normalizing that basis. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. What, uh, what I've been running into is, couple of guys don't know if they can get their cattle into the plant to get killed. And that's a pretty familiar, pretty familiar refrain here lately. And that's the biggest thing right now is uh, you feel like if you can get those cattle in and get them slated for the kill floor, you got to go ahead and do it. And if I, I think that's what happened with the April deliveries there at the end of the month of April, there were some deliveries there that didn't really on paper make any sense delivering at 85 88 cents you know maybe in the low 90s when cash was even the you know at least a dollar 105 even 115 and i imagine there were people that figured if they can't get their their cattle killed they can at least deliver them against the board and get 85 90 cents rather than and getting rejected or you know put on the back burner and now you got 1400 pound animals and don't know what you're going to do with them so that's the biggest thing right now is is having these guys stay in touch with your packer with your order buyer and i hate to say it your hands are kind of tied right now from the standpoint you got to be able to get into the plant as where our kills are two-thirds of what they normally are and the other problem we've got it's kind of a two-tiered market where the 
southern bids. They're catching up a little bit in Iowa this week, it sounds like, Iowa, Nebraska. But, you know, you were getting, they were getting 115 in Kansas and Texas last week. We're getting, what, sixty in the meat, you know, which works out to about a buck. There was a wide spread there that, that made it tough. Yeah, it was, it was quite a bit easier, which is, you don't hear very often in this industry when, when you could stay ahead of it and get your cash bought, your hedge bought, to, you know, eight, ten dollars cheaper than the cash. But that window is closing. And right now it's just a matter of getting your cattle killed, getting, getting your cattle into the plant. And you might have to take that hedge off a bit early, you know, in this scenario. And, and yeah, with, with some of the things the other guys have talked about as far as most likely haven't seen the bottom and where the profit drivers are. And yeah, here we are limit up. You had a bit of a window yesterday to get it done. You had a bit of a window, say, last Thursday to to get some of those covered. Now you feel like you got to wait and uh, basically buy the next dip. But if you're getting those cattle, if they're scheduled and you've got them priced, especially get that hedge out of there as quick as you can. Otherwise, because you can't let them get you both ways. But, yeah, very, very tough environment, especially right now. Do you guys uh, like to weigh in on that that same question on on basis and and trying to look forward? I've got, I've got just, just a comment, comment on that. that. Uh, that uh, Jake's, Jake's exactly right. right. I mean, these are again unprecedented times. A lot of guys, guys have been in the business for a long, long time. time. Never imagined that there, there would be a day, day where they, they couldn't get them scheduled in, even if there's, there's two weeks, weeks out. out. But now even further outside than that. But well, one, one of the things, things that is a, still a, considered a legitimate hedge is in the case of uh, where you would uh, have to sell the cattle, not so much on your terms or like uh, Jake's saying uh, for scheduling and what have you, but letting those cattle go and turn around and retain ownership in one way or another, whether it's futures or options, you still are holding on to that pricing mechanism, and I understand there's a risk to that, but uh, at the same time, uh, at this point, we're $20 under the cash market, and uh, maybe there would be a re pretty good reward, even if a guy was using a uh, strategy and an options. Uh, same way as, as well could be used over in the feeder cattle, that are seeing uh, 10, 12 year lows right now. And uh, we'd like to think that this is short term or short lived, but uh, it's hard to say how long it'll be before we're up to a 90, 100% of what we capacity that we were. It's gonna take a lot of digesting, a lot of uh, maneuvering and uh, creativity to get us to that level again. And that's that's all I had. Scott or Patrick, anything on that in addition? No, I mean, it's just it's a short squeeze, right? And um, everybody's feeling it at the same time. I think it's a beautiful thing. The cash is going higher, but who's really participating? I think that was uh, Jake's biggest point. And, uh, yeah, I think well, it, Scott, it, it, it's, Scott, we'll turn to you kind of on this same topic of of. Uh, cash and and trading these cattle i mean obviously the uh the fundamental news is the supply chain is you know really backed up uh what advice are you guys giving producers a who have market ready cattle and and are having these challenges you know maybe like gary just got done talking about a little bit but uh what about the producer who's who's going to be marketing cattle or scheduled to market cattle in the next 45 or 60 days kind of talk a little bit about those discussions on a, on a cash basis. Yep, definitely can. I mean, we're all keeping an eye on that kill as close as we can. Um, some things that I'm looking at here, you know, we're, we're having to take a lower price in the South just to get in, you know, and that that's just kind of in the reality of it, just to keep cattle moving along. We're lucky that it happened now. It, it happened in, in this April timeframe when we don't have a calf crop breeding down our neck quite yet. We're just getting cattle cleaned up, yearlings cleaned up. So I think we're sitting in a little bit better position 
than we think as far as getting cattle backed up. I know there's still plenty out there, but at least that calf crap doesn't seem to be breathing down our neck quite yet. So um, at least as far as a futures protection on, on something shorter term, it's a lot easier to kind of look at something to help you sleep at night. But I'm going to start showing my cattle a little bit early. Um, I've got something that's going to be going and say uh, in June, I'm going to start forward thinking they're going to be on the show list next week uh, is when I'm going to put some on that I would like to kind of market in June. So um, you're going to want to keep in contact with your packers for sure. And if you ever did that one little deal for a packer, you helped him out when he needed some cattle, you know, he called in a favor, you call in that favor back now. I mean, that's kind of the 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 situation we're in you use up all of your favors now because because it is tough and we don't know what it holds i mean if we start getting over 100,000 kill in the next coming weeks um hey i'm going to feel pretty good but if we start staying at 82 to 85 then then the alarms are going off again so it's all going to matter what happens here in the next couple of weeks whether we can start ramping this thing up or not um it's all tied to this upfront situation whether we're going to get through it or not so you bet Um, Patrick, I'm going to move to you and, and kind of switch gears on something you and I, uh, this group had talked about in preparation is we really talk a lot about, um, the cattle right now. And obviously that's the, the thing, but looking forward, uh, can you talk a little bit about paying attention to inputs, uh, and timing? And we, we talked a little, I mean, a lot about cattle, but talk about strategies in, uh, in grain, in grain, uh, specifically corn and maybe some strategies for farmer feeders who may not participate in the, in the cash mar market daily and, and really some opportunity that might be there. Sure. Um, I mean, as a whole, like, I mean, right now corn's cheap. I mean, I, I would just own calls personally. I think that's the easiest thing to do. Um, in terms of like the farmer feeder, I think the, you know, depending on what marketing weight you're looking for, you always want to be looking at the, you know, the actual consumer aspect part of it. And right now, you know, I think you will be incentivized to finish cattle, you know, going forward. You definitely don't want to be selling feeder weight animals in this type of environment. It's going to pay you more to kind of hang out of them for the long haul. But overall, I mean, right now we're talking about lows in basically every market. Your input costs are very affordable. I don't necessarily think that uh, going and sourcing it all direct contract in the future is the best way to go, especially whenever the options are so cheap and you could ultimately see cheaper interactions with this going forward. But I mean, very simply put, you uh, you don't want to buy, you know, flooding insurance while your house is flooding. So look at the stuff that gives you an opportunity now. Uh, it's the same notion of, you know, let's not be going crazy and buying put options and cattle whenever everybody knows that the fire is right here. It's the same kind of idea. And uh, the contrarian mindset in these regards you know, we're we're all looking at the end product of being the meat. I have never seen a more depressive group than the grain farmer at this point in time. And it's the reality. Um, they're, you know, they're they're just they're beaten up at this point in the same way as everybody else. And, uh, you know, to, to the to the notion of the thesis that I find uh, that works good with all markets is what's their incentive to sell forward right now? Zero. So you see the commercials getting long again, the end users getting long in the same way that, you know, the the packers are basically getting along the live cattle in this regard. So in those two notions, it tells me that corn is cheap. It's cheap feed. If you're a farmer feeder, own them, aim for the end product, which is the meat for the animal, protect the corn input cost. I think the cattle market will solve itself. Scott, Gary, or Jake, any more to add to that? Yeah, I would agree with that statement. Uh, it, I do believe the cattle have uh, a quicker way of uh, possibly fixing uh, their situation than uh, maybe the the grain farm. It's going to take uh, some time, and and it's hinging on a number of other elements, uh, crude oil and and uh, ethanol, and you know you get a, a whole bunch of other outside markets that are going to need to come together. Um, and I, I really uh, totally agree on the fear that we're just have gone through is going to carry with us for quite some time and it will keep us more current. Uh, we're not going to probably see as, as soon as the Packers are able to get more current and we clean up show lists at some point, 
you're going to see a, a lot of the farmers, feeders, uh, staying more current, maybe marketing those cattle a little bit on the lighter side than what they had normally been pushing uh, just because. Uh, we've got to got to get them gone and and make sure that we don't get into a trap in the future. But that's uh, as well a very good point on that currentness. So that's all I had. Scott, anything to add there? Uh, so I there. think. Yeah. Oh yeah, go, go ahead, ahead, Scott. No, I was just going to tell you, you can go ahead and go to the next question. I was trying to get the mute deal off. Oh, you bet. <laughs> Not a problem. Uh, this this is for everybody, and I'd kind of like to open it up and, and whoever would like to uh, uh, to talk about it first. But I think really um, we we do have some alternative feeding uh, arrangements in the, in the north here, whether it be Holstein feeders. Uh, I think we've seen an increase in, in feeding cull cows as that kill capacity has changed. Um, there, there's obviously a lot of backgrounded cattle that, you know, are protected. Can you guys talk or, or give some folks, uh, maybe talk a lot about how you examine each of those markets and maybe some, uh, some ways to look at, uh, obviously basis is much different in Holsteins. Uh, it's really different in fed cows. Can you maybe talk a little bit about how to approach those types of markets? Yeah, I can touch on it a little bit here to start, I guess. But yeah, in today's environment, um, it's extremely risky to feed something that's not not directly tied to the market. So so there's definitely that added risk. And, and when you have a market situation you're in now, your risk just got heightened completely. So um, for me, when I'm looking at a, at a Holstein market, uh, if I was gonna feed a Holstein, I would not wanna do it without a basis contract. I am an anti-basis contract when it comes to, to beef cattle. Um, but when I've got Holsteins, I've got to have a home for them. I have to at least make sure that that's locked in. Too many guys got caught when all of a sudden Dakota City was not going to take them. And then Skyler or Cargill was getting filled up uh, with them, um, or JBS, I guess, was getting filled up with them. So, I mean, there, there's so much extra risk there that you can get hit with and can really, really hurt. So you have to have more of those side things like the basis locked in to me if I'm going to start to really stick my neck out on some of those situations. So um, that'd be about the only time I'd be looking towards some sort of a basis contract knowing I got a home for them. And once I can tie it to something, then I can start to protect myself. If you're a guy that that never hedges, um, maybe, maybe that's your hitch. You just kind of do that. You take the good years with the bad years, um, no matter what. Um, if you're going to take a, a large, large loss, then when the market does turn and is moving in the right way, not going to be so quick to lock in that little bit of profit because I need a large, large win. So riding the ups and downs that way a little bit. Anybody else weigh in on that issue? Yeah, uh, just uh, couldn't set it any better. I mean, I've fed uh, the whole scenes before, been in a situation where they want to lock those up uh, 11, 12 months in advance. They want to make sure they know where their kill is, but uh, they there really isn't a perfect fit. It's uh, almost like trying to lock in uh, something foreign on uh, – sheep on a cattle contract uh, same way with cat cows or Holsteins uh, separate market separate kill plants and uh, it can be dangerous trying to assume that it's going to keep a percentage of relativity to the uh, beef market and so that's the, the danger there and I would totally agree there's if there's ever a time where uh, you just your hands are tied, where you have to go with a forward contract, that would be it for sure. With the Holsteins and the cows are even more, a little more in the wind, tough to uh, tie down. You bet, Patrick. I probably moved to you on this question, and and I really like everybody to weigh in if you can. Is 
uh, this time in the market and, and all of these, all the volatility and the, uh, the uncertainty will obviously change the industry and uh, we'll hopefully learn from it and, and uh, you know, do things differently. How do you think this, uh, this time will really change the market uh, and our approach to risk? And do you think there'll be any structural changes uh, to the CME contracts going forward? I mean, I've debated that myself. I think that, uh, and I mean, everybody, any, any like governmental or like mandated, you know, uh, just legislation, let's call it, um, it's going to create an opportunity for abuse one way or another in the same way that we can claim that you know, the current situation is also abused in the same situation. Um, I think that actually having like proper negotiated sales and a larger percentage, that will be better. Uh, I would probably get us away from, um, like Ryan had mentioned with uh, the, the black cattle basis contracting just to get kill space and things like that. Um, that seems to be a pretty serious issue right now, at least. But I hate to say it, I don't think a lot is really going to change. Um, if the structure of the board pans out the way that the technical looking is going to be, we should see some pretty strong moves to the top side and, and it will be short squeezes and people, uh, you know, hedging too early, let's call it. But I think that if, if the average cattle feeder would have an understanding of what a dollar thirty on April live cattle means during the month of January, and what that means for its potential cash price on a year-to-year -year average basis, I think that that would change their way that they interact with the board. Right now, everybody seems to have this notion that uh, there's the chance that the basis goes negative almost all the time. Well, that's typically not the case because history is repeating. We all make our decisions based off of previous, you know, interactions. If we change the structure of the board to something that's more, uh, let's say like box beef related, um, you know, even then you're probably gonna have different lobbyist groups, different players trying to finagle with it. I think the only thing that you can really do is just just try not to be too greedy. Um, like a lot of our decision-making um, at our company, we, we do have an algorithm and a large part of the algorithm is looking at what the average break-even price on any animals has been, you know, throughout the year. If you're buying eight weights, seven weights, six weights. And we've seen historically that as soon as people get to about a hundred bucks uh, profit potential, just on the board, not even including basis, that we see really aggressive hedging. Um, I think if people actually understood the basis potential, they'd be hedging even sooner because in this type of year, you got about 250 on the board if you were hedged the whole time. So I don't think that there's anything necessarily wrong with how the board is working. This has just been a ridiculous time. Uh, the lack of openness in the negotiation for the cash sales, I think, is a serious issue. And that will, in my opinion, be solved. We got enough people fighting for the good in this regard. And, you know, it's like the stock market. Everybody's overly pessimistic, yet look at the NASDAQ, right? There's there's forward-looking money that is, uh, that is going to work and seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. I think we just have to get to that end of the tunnel, and we'll probably look back and learn about things that we could have done better. Again, we'd be jump, open to. Yeah, go ahead, Scott. I'll jump in and touch on some of that stuff. Uh, different changes that I think are going to happen. Um, at our office, we've got a couple of us that are involved in quite a few different committees. Some with CME uh, changes, you know. Um, some with uh, different cattlemen's groups. Um, we've I've heard the negotiated cash. Patrick touched on that. Agree with him 100%. We need some more of that. And I think a bulk of the industry is agreeing that that's something that should happen. Um, and we're still working on ways to fix that. From 2004 to 2015, our market was 97% correlated with the box beef price. That's the, the biggest thing we hear. It was staying fairly correlated. From 2016 to 19, it was more like 17% correlated. And now uh, it feels like zero as it skyrockets up and we head down. So that's why it's spurring a lot of people with pitchforks and let's change this. Let's throw that under the bus. Let's throw the CME under the bus, you know, going after everything. So trying to wade through some of this stuff and make sure we don't have any unintended consequences um, to start with the CME. Yeah. They're, they're aware that there's, you know, some issues and trying to make sure that this market can stay tied to it. And they know that it's our livelihood. 
Well, for one, the long speculator has pretty much been killed off over the years and, and is non-existent. If they knew that we were correlated to boxed beef, the long speculator would be jumping at this market down here, um, trying to, to narrow up that gap a little bit. And if we had a large amount of negotiated cash, you know, and we were definitely tied to that, might be looking at that a little more. Um, to try to help the long speculator, um, the, some of those hedge funds are looking for larger uh, limits. When we're going limit up every day, limit down, you know, a lot of different limit moves. They don't like that. Uh, they don't have the ability to trade. Cattle is a small part of what they trade anyway. So um, they are asking for wider limits. And, and we know when we're out working cattle, we can't afford to have the market move $9 or, or something like that. That changes. So, so there's a little bit of talk about that. Um, there's been some talks about the, the pre-open, trying to squeeze that down a little bit so they don't have a six o'clock in the morning pre-open starts already that they're already putting in orders and it's already been locked limit up for the pre-open and then it doesn't open limit up. So trying to shorten that up. Those are a few small changes the CME is trying to make. They're not, like Patrick says, they're not going to come in and change, um, you know, big, big things that, like tying it to boxed beef right away. That That's something that's going to take take a lot more work. Uh, I know it's been talked about to let's just start a boxed beef contract by itself. Well, let, let's just do that. That's been brought up some of the early, early stages. That's not something that's really far at all. Anything other than that than being mentioned. But also when you mention negotiated cash to the CME and you say we're trying to do this to get more negotiated cash, they just start grinning. They're like, yes, please, that would be be a lot of help. And we've seen that huge shift in the last 10 years where we were you know, 60% cash negotiated and about 30% formula. And now we've gotten so heavy on the formula side that it's it's really affected the the overall cattle market. And we've been a large uh, partner in trying to get the 5014, the 3014s going. Um, uh, 5014 is going to be introduced at the highest level. Uh, we hope today, um, Senator Grassley is going to be bringing that up. So going to government is not what the cattle industry wanted saying hey government will you please help me out and mandate this but we ran out of options uh this battle started um long ago and and was really brought to a head again in 2016 where there was quite a few battles in the industry and the the, the south said we're going to trade more negotiated cash we're going to do it and four years later here we are um we're trading less negotiated cash so uh, they've done nothing. So this is what it's came down to that we're we're looking at legislation. So hoping if we could get some more negotiated out of the South that we could stabilize a lot of things, be more tied to uh, be more tied to something like uh, uh, I think it was Jake said the formulas in the South getting twenty dollars a hundred more than than we are in the North. And we're the ones trying to set the price for them. They've got their their formulas down there. They're getting taken care of and and their slaughter has not dropped near as much. The negotiated guy is the guy that's getting hurt right now. He can't get his cattle in. The formulas are set up. They've they've got their slot. And when you're at two thirds capacity of slaughter, uh, yep, negotiated guy is the one that they don't need so much. And and we're the ones struggling. We're just we're the last of the independents in the beef industry, and and that's why we fight this negotiated uh, cash market so hard. Because if you look at cash broilers or cash eggs or cash hogs, for that example, it's virtually non-existent. Uh, you've got a hog market that is priced on the tiniest of slivers for the entire hog market. And getting that to tie together with the futures has, has been absolutely tough. And we're fighting tooth and nail to try not to become uh, those markets in particular. You bet, good perspective. I wanna get to a, a question on the chat. Um, I think we we hear a lot about governmental programs that are are uh, either going to be coming with the direct payments, things like that. Uh, but you know we've heard about a similar uh, program that uh, was implemented in Canada during BSE, and that's the set aside. Do you guys think there'll be any traction for those types of programs to try to get through this this uh, supply chain um, time period, or, or what do you hear on those types of programs? And then uh, I, after after this question, we're going to open it up for live questioning. Okay, I can touch the latest on the set aside. Uh, personally, I don't think it's getting enough traction. We've got uh, a couple different organizations in the South that kind of want it, Texas Cattle Feeders. And uh, so some of those Southern organizations are the ones that want this. 
And it caught a lot of backlash uh, just at the end of last week because it's got a lot of moving parts to it. And first of all, in all reality, if they did get it going, it's not going to be until maybe August, maybe September before they can even get it rolled out. And we are long past when we need a program like that. And also the question was brought up, what does this do to the feeder calf guy? If we're, if we're for the entire cattle industry, what does it do to them? Um, and those feeder calf guy, their hairs are standing up because it really hurts the feeder calf guy. And that's a sector that you don't want really to, to be hurting even worse than they already are. They've had to take their fair share too. So uh, I think it's losing a little bit of steam in that. And I think we're doing it ourselves already the way <laughs> – the way uh, the way it looks, the market's almost trying to fix itself a little bit. We're all trying to push our calves back a little bit and feed them a little bit longer. So I, I just think it's just delaying the inevitable. And you know, so my my opinion is I hope we we don't pass it. But um, those were the comments that I had. It caught a lot of backlash just at the end of last week. Any other opinions there, guys? I guess just uh, two cents worth that, uh, you know, I, I don't think it uh, worked very well in Canada. I don't uh, think some of these programs uh, have worked that well in the past uh, on certain, in certain sectors. And I would probably uh, vote against that. And like you said, I think the farmer and rancher is going to, uh, make that curve himself and and uh we've backed off rations we've pushed them back a little further buying us more time and uh, i think uh, some of those things are going to get uh, fixed within the sector and then price will come along to hopefully uh, incentivize uh, you know a better market down the road yeah and i know i can speak for for our company that we've been getting a lot of those questions on how to how to maybe back cattle up or put them on a little bit of cruise control and and so you know if you're if you're on the line and and you've got questions about that uh, certainly reach out to to our uh, nutrition and production specialist because there there is some things I think we can look at and we obviously have more more latitude than than uh, than a confined you know a hog or a chicken or anything like that and so uh, there are probably some some questions and and there's maybe not the perfect answer but uh it does look like the market is is really trying to rectify that itself and so i uh, would like to open it up now um we've, we've answered a couple of those questions on the chat uh if if we can uh open the line if anybody would like to ask any questions live uh, we would certainly uh, certainly entertain that right now There we got the the mute offer. We, we well, I'm a little worried to unmute on everybody at once. We may get some un, unnecessary okay. background noise, but I would just encourage <laughs> you if you're on your computer or your phone, you should be able to hover over and unmute um, yourself by clicking on the microphone. I certainly can give it a try, Ryan, if you'd like me to. Maybe can, uh, can you hear me? If, if, yes. Yeah, this is uh, Isaac DeBoer, and I'm a lender, and I, I think some of the real issues that I see with folks, and, and as I'm listening to you guys talk, there's a lot of different strategies and things that are being done uh, by producers in combination with their broker, um, but there is a hard time for the producer to either, A, they don't understand it, or B, they can't communicate it in a fashion that's understandable to the lender, or C, they just flat out don't understand the risk to the transaction. So I'd like to know from you guys, what sort of conversations are you having with your producers, especially with this extreme volatility? I think it presents tremendous opportunity, but it's a, it's a feast or famine type of situation, and uh, a, a person's position and their outlook and risk that they can either uh, stomach or that they can actually 
put their dollars behind can change drastically from one turn to the next. So what type of conversations are you guys having with producers and at what point are you bringing them in or telling them, hey, if you don't understand this, we better not be going down this road? Yeah, I think it's it's every every, every conversation. Yeah, go ahead, Scott. Okay. Uh, every conversation we have with guys, I mean, like like I said, we're trying to trying to best suit the individual and trying to walk through. If you're going to start selling an option, I I make dang sure clear that hey, if you're going to sell a 110 call, that that's that's your ceiling. You know, it, it there is margin risk after that. So. And I think there's there's a group of people that have been doing this for years. They absolutely understand it. And absolutely training new ones is something that needs to be done in the industry. It's not done enough. We uh, we were going to start do a one on one class here at our office. Thought we, we talked about that um, just pre COVID-19 literally had it planned and everything started shut down. And, and the number of people that we had signing up was that list was growing uh, substantially. So there's a definite need for that for people that don't know what they're doing, don't know what they're getting into. And um, yeah, we got to keep having some of those one-on-ones and um, it gets, it gets tough, you know, when you have, uh, I guess I'm trying to figure out how to say this, but sometimes that guy doesn't get enough, enough help. The guy that is maybe going to do a one lot or a two lot when you're trying to call into a broker on a day when we're limit up, limit down and it's busy, busy. So yeah, that's, that's a that's a tough one. We try to make time for every single guy and walk through every single trade that they have. But some customers are letting me just pretty much be hands on. Uh, I just text them what to do and they do it. I can't have that for everybody because I don't know how everybody is. But once you get established with a broker for a certain amount of time uh, or established with an individual, um, I think that's what uh, Gary and Jake were talking about. You might know better what he needs to put on for a hedge better than he does after you get to know them. So you're going to want to find a broker um, that you can work with and you're going to want to stay with them. So over the years, I might work with a guy for a couple of years and I'm just getting the hang of exactly what he wants, what when he gets pushed wrong or right, what he wants to do and how, how he reacts. There's a certain trade that I might like, but I know I can't do it for customer A because he will not like that at all if I get him on the wrong side of that one. So yeah, it's definitely has to be open communication. What's this trade mean? What's the bottom side? What's the upside? So uh, we're, we're definitely coached as brokers nonstop about making sure we're explaining the risk. So um, if we're, we're not explaining the risk or somebody has not got it, maybe it, I'm hoping that they are understanding the risk on, on, uh, on the trades that they're putting on. Uh, I was just reading his question here on the chat, you know, about uh, customer first walks in the door, you know, that's the guy that try to get steered toward puts, you know, and you get him in there with the safest, for lack of a better word, maybe more conservative is maybe a better term, conservative type strategy. And after you've worked with the guy, you know, it, it, it takes time. Yeah, it might take a couple of years, like Scott said. But, it, you know, you have a handful of conversations with him. After a bit, you kind of get what the customer, kind of what makes him tick, so to speak. You know, if he, he buys a put worth worth four bucks and it's it's down to 325 and he's in a panic, okay, well, now I know that. Now, that's an extreme example, of course, but what I'm getting at is you you, you got to get to know that guy, and then you got to get to know the lender. You know, uh, he's uh, Isaac here mentioned having everyone on the same page. He used the tools like uh, the lender getting the statements. You know, preferably by email. The sooner the better. So when that those that hedge get gets put on, the lender knows it in in real time. That sort of stuff. And yeah, it's a matter of everybody communicating. Let's not keep secrets. Let's uh, get a plan, stick to it. We want to put it this level. If the market gets to this level, we'll roll them up. And that might not be the ideal strategy, but at least you've got a plan. And people can't, you know, go off kilter. It's when you start 
with futures, straight hedging on futures and selling calls and selling puts underneath if you go that route, that's that's when you really need to to have your your plan B, so to speak, your your exit strategy. What are we gonna do? And if something changes with the lender, he needs to know, hey, this guy's reaching his credit limit and I can't get the board to 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 bump it up. Okay, well, now we need to shift gears. And yeah, it's 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 when there's a lack of communication is when it can really break down. But I definitely understand the question and uh, sure appreciate it. And no easy answer, you know, other than try to keep communicating. Great advice. Is there any other questions from the the uh, the crowd? I don't. I don't see any more currently on the chat. Uh, if there's, if there is, you feel free to to type it in or or uh, Sarah, if you want to try it on mute. I, I got a feeling we'll hear a lot of tractors and and uh, cattle and. <laughs> but uh, my question is the lack of correlation between the futures and the cash market. Um, make it difficult to, to hedge with the futures. April went off the board considerably under cash, and it could go the opposite the next time. And you think you're hedged, and you're not really hedged because of a lack of correlation. So that is my question. Agreed. <laughs> um, I'll uh, I'll expand upon that. A lot of times volatility pushes participation out of the market. And that lack of participation is usually a major tipping point for the market, both on top side and bottom side. And usually whenever the markets get broken, quote unquote, let's say, that participation then goes forward looking. So if you guys are the participation on the selling end, who's gonna be selling it? That's where I would leave that to. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I mean, and, and it's uh, definitely something that a lot of us kind of want answers for. And I kind of alluded to earlier, the long speculator is is not there. So we're trying to figure out how do we get some longs back in the market? And and also, I think if we start to get more negotiated trade, get get more of that actually moving, I think that that's also going to help help us have a, have a market like that. But a lot of the rules that have been thrown at the CME have definitely been been for the, the hedgers. Um, increasing the weights uh you can deliver on a contract way past the actual month uh some of the june contracts didn't get delivered you know after you had a july 4 holiday that some of those deliveries carry out all the way into july so some of those rules i think are something that we're trying to address to say hey let's try to make this more of a what's going on right now market rather than spreading it out so much Well, and maybe one thing to touch on too, I think basis is such an anomaly right now with, with the current situation. Maybe just talk a little bit about uh, the exploration of, of historic basis, right? And, and in, a, in a more normalized time period of, of looking at, you know, how to, how to take a, a better advantage of historical basis information. Well, normally at this time of the year, cash wouldn't move that much. It would just be the board pricing it in and then incentivizing people to pull cattle forward to keep them current. So that's kind of what we're doing now, right? You're creating this really big positive basis in the front to incentivize people to market cattle now. But then we have this uh, almost, <laughs> it's kind of funny because we have a supply issue, but it's, uh, it's very much artificial. The cattle are there, but it's a supply issue on the side of getting the meat and getting the cattle dead. So the basis structure that we're actually seeing is very seasonally accurate. It's just being met with an extreme drop in the cash price as well. That's one important thing to realize is that seasonally you do get a 20 to 30 cent basis correlation with certain parts of the South. And then going forward, that basis will then tighten up, uh, i.e. the board will come up to cash or cash will slowly come down to the board. Right now, us seeing the cash market stay supportive, if not go higher, is partially why we're seeing such extreme movements higher to the board, because there's no real correlation that the cash market needs to go back down or really to anywhere near those uh, futures prices and where they were. I would agree. Will probably, we could possibly see 
some uh, changes here uh, in regards to what the past has been on normal uh, basis, the way it's been here lately, has been uh, very beneficial for the guy that's been a futures or option hedger. Uh, he's way ahead of the game in the last, uh, well, uh, I guess I look back about 10 uh, months out of the year, he's winning uh, by having them hedged on the board and uh, waiting for the cash. And uh, but every hedger is has a different temperature. I like to think of it as uh, taking the temp of that new customer or old, and how much is he willing to uh, risk or put up? And yet that basis seems to be uh, in the future might be a little out of whack here for the next few months. That could be possible. Uh, but at this point, it's quite a wide basis. Very good. Is there any other questions from the uh, the participants? You you may just be able to actually scroll over the bottom of your screen there and hit the microphone button to unmute if you've got a question. We'll just maybe give that a couple seconds. Well, if not, I, I do have uh, one more question, and, and it's for all of the panelists. And and if something does pop in here, either on the chat or or if somebody chimes in after, we we certainly take those questions. Um, but I think you know we're we're in a time where we've we've probably belabored the point that it's it's uh, historic and there's really nothing to benchmark it. Looking forward uh, as a big picture. What is the biggest opportunity you guys see uh, for Midwestern cattle feeders and uh, kind of looking looking forward and, and finding opportunity? Scott, we maybe start with you. Yeah. Uh, currently right now, some of the opportunities, I'm looking at a market, you know, I think on our pre-call, we all kind of alluded to it a little bit that uh, I think there's tremendous opportunity um out there in the deferred contracts uh that i think we we are going to get back to a normal i i don't think this is something that we're going to crawl in this cave and we're going to be in this cave for forever uh we are going to get back to somewhat of a normal it's going to happen it's not going to stay like this forever so trying to make sure that i'm still in the game um trying to be out there trying to buy some feeder calves trying to trying to replace some of that so if i lost my wallet in the feed yard I'm going to go back to the feed yard to look for it. So kind of using that strategy a little bit. I'm still pretty friendly on, on some of those deferred contracts and trying to stay a little bit open back there. I, I'm not uh, really doing much for protection out there. I think the worst of the worst is in. So trying to move ahead. Uh, we had excellent demand prior to this. Yes, the economy is maybe a little bit different. We've got a lot more unemployed people, but um, I do think uh, the overall cattle market was ready to rally prior to this, and now we've got you know a shortage of meat, can't get meat to the shelves. So definitely some opportunity on the demand side there that I want to try to try to be there for, uh, making sure I'm still in the game. If I finally get my cattle gone, uh, I want to make sure I have something back in there to try to get back into the market there. Um, one other point that lost me, but I'll leave it at that. I guess I Patrick, think of, uh, oh yeah, go ahead. I, I think of one thing when you, you, the guy that you picture, you visualize the guy kicking the can around the yard, uh, that uh, things are, are really tough on the fat side. At the same time, take another look over on the feeder side, and maybe you can, maybe your pens aren't ready for calves, but out into October, maybe there's an opportunity. Uh, to buy those feeders on the board using an option strategy, using some type of a, a technique over there to at least, uh, you know, when things are down over on the fat side, they're usually down on the feeders and maybe an opportunity to uh, buy some feeders at a discount. And some, you know, a lot of those are the board, cash board on feeders has been, I'm sorry, the board uh, on feeders has been 
lower than what the cash market on feeders has been. So there's a um, possible good advantage to be able to not do, you know, stand back and not do anything, but maybe there's an opportunity to pick up 25 to 50% of your calves for that month and uh, be able to cash in, capitalize on that side. Very good. Jake or Patrick? I was just going to add this, what Scott said. I think he hit the nail on the head. I think you uh, you got to be more open in this situation. Certainly don't cap out the top end on any new animals that you're buying whatsoever. Jake, anything else? Well, these guys pretty much covered it. Yeah, it's going to look, well, who knows what it's going to look like. I mean, unprecedented times. You, you know, Warren Buffett's always talking about you don't want to bet against America. I guess I would line up in that camp from the standpoint of longer term. But if there is a hiccup yet, you want to make sure you're covered. But I do agree you'd want to leave the top end open best you can. Very good. Well, guys, uh, I really want to take uh, this opportunity to, to thank our panelists for joining. Uh, I thought they offered some really good advice, very timely and, and pertinent to the, to the marketplace. And so um, this, this meeting was recorded. We'll, uh, we'll post it and uh, likely to our beef blog and uh, a couple other spots. And so if you know folks that, uh, that didn't get a chance to jump on today, uh, please point them that way. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody that did join in. Uh, if there's anything that we can do for you uh, nutritionally, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to any of the form of feed professionals uh, in your area. Uh, we'd love to, to be able to help you work through these times, whether it be on production or uh, uh, examining different ingredients. Uh, we, we really do value your business and, and all the future business to come. So thanks everybody. Uh, uh, make sure to to uh, enjoy the rest of planting. Hopefully that's going well. And uh, we'll, we'll talk to you all very soon. Thanks for having us. Thanks for putting it on. You bet. Yeah. Thank you.